Hey people, Kevin Thomas on Point Dogs. We had a crazy incident happen in my house on uh, New Year's Day concerning a, a Feeney, and that's worth talking about. So let's talk about uh, why you should maybe train your Dutch Shepherd in protection work and this notion of a, uh, of a red zone dog. Yeah, all right, let's get into it. Happy New Year. All right, so to cut to the chase, a strange dog enters our house on New Year's Day and Feeney beats the shit out of the dog. All right, so we'll come back to that story and fill in some of the details, but I want to step out and talk about this concept of red zone dogs. Okay, so in reality, there's really no such thing as a red zone dog because red zone is a mental state that the dog enters and exits. And a good way to understand it is to think of like a criminal defense attorney trying to get his client off of a capital murder case and they plead a temporary insanity. So it might not get him a not guilty verdict, but probably get him a reduced sentence if the, the jury buys it, right? Because you're arguing that, oh, yes, that my client was not in his right mind um, at the time that he committed this crime, all right? And that's the same thing with a dog going into a red zone state. The dog is not in its right state of mind. It's not in its normal state of mind. And somebody, the owner could actually even, you know, get bit by trying to like, like tap the dog on the back or something. And you get the dog to snap out of it and the dog might whip around and just inadvertently, you know, bite its own owner because, you know, the dog is not thinking straight. So. Uh, different dogs have different triggers, and some dogs, you know, might never enter a red zone state. Uh, Feeney's trigger is uh, strangers entering the house. So, uh, basically, I have to uh, circumvent that process, get him, get in front of it, right, and prevent her from entering that state. Because, again, once a dog enters a red zone state, you know, it can be a problem uh, for everyone involved. Another good way to think of... Uh, a red zone state, dogs in a red zone state. You can think of two dogs fighting and red zone is, like I said, a mental state. It characterized by intense focused ferocity where violence is imminent. Now, if you think that you're gonna break up a dog fight by, with some basic obedience commands, Talking about Kirby, Kirby, stop, Kirby, lay down, Kirby, come here, Kirby, sit. Yeah, that is not going to cut it <laughs> for breaking up a dog fight, you know, two dogs in a red zone state. So an incident that happened when Zulu was four months old, I was getting ready to take him out on a walk and I, uh, my son was going with me. My son, I think, was like 12 at the time. And I grabbed uh, my walking stick that I always bring, and I'll show you that in a second. It's a weaponized uh, walking stick. And then I said to my son, should we get uh, should we get the Doberman? At that time, I was training a, a, a full-grown Doberman uh, who had a mean streak in him and, you know, was very protective. And my son said, nah, nah, we don't need to. And I said, yeah, let me get him, you know, because you never know what kind of irresponsible idiots we're going to meet out there. So... I grab the walking stick, we grab the Doberman, and we head out. So here's the walking stick that I was very fond of. All right, this is the end that you can use to break a windshield. If I don't know, can't imagine any occasion where you'd need to break a windshield, but that's there. On this end, it's a compass. And this is, you know, it's pretty strong. It's pretty, you know, it's pretty heavy too. It's not, you know, some lightweight thing made out of aluminum. And then you can unscrew it and it has uh, two different weapons inside. So when you unscrew it, this is what you've got. A saw, a saw on one end, and a serrated knife on the other end, All right? And we get a couple of blocks away from the house and all of a sudden this massive pit bull comes rushing across two lanes of traffic no leash and attacks the Doberman. You know, fortunately he didn't go for Zulu because, you know, Zulu four months, you know, he would have been would have been dead meat at that time. 
So the two dogs, you know, start fighting. Now I've got the Doberman on a leash, you know, a long leash, like the uh, 15 foot leash, you know, leash I've had since like, you know, 2000. Um, real strong leash, but so anyway, they're going at it. And so they go from the sidewalk, you know, into the middle of the street and now we're blocking traffic. And so I uh, tell one of the boys that I'm with, cause I'm with the, the, the dog, you know, two of his owners were with us. And I have one of them uh, hold the leash and then I take this stick and I start whacking the hell out of the dog and it has no effect on him. So then I turn it to the other side where it has the piece that I showed you where you could actually break a arm. So this is what I'm whacking this dog with. It's having no effect on him. And, and it's unusual that we were attacked by that dog because this was a bully pit. And one of the things about uh, bully pit bulls uh, is that, um, yeah, most of them are not dog aggressive, you know, unlike a standard American uh, pit bull, which has that, um, you know, fighting thing in their bloodline, in their history, whatever. You know, bully pits, you know, they're trying to breed that out of them. But anyway, so we're attacked by this guy, you know, the monstrous head and everything, right? So I'm blasting him, nothing is happening, like I said. I Then I start whacking him with this end, you know, pounding him with that. Nothing is happening also. I'm like, oh my gosh, right? This dog is oblivious. He's so intensely focused on the fight, right? That nothing is, is having effect on him. So then I get the idea of unscrewing the weapon and stabbing the dog with the knife. But at this point, uh, we're not just blocking traffic. We've attracted uh, a crowd too. So there's spectators around. And I'm like, nah, I better not do that because uh, then I'll probably be the one, you know, end up getting arrested uh, for whatever reason they come up with. So the, uh, one of the guys that uh, we were blocking his car, he gets out and he identifies himself as an experienced dog man. And so I'm like, okay, great. And I said, grab the uh, pit bull's hind legs. So he grabs the pit bull's hind legs. The Doberman, you know, I have him on a leash still. I'm holding the leash. It's long. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to... um uh, drop the leash entirely. There was no need to, and and the, by the same token, I'm not gonna uh, try to choke him out and pull him off and whatever because you know we're the ones that are being assaulted. So anyway, the dopeman, you know, was you know more than handling his own. He was actually you know winning the fight uh, because you know it's an on point dog, and you know one of our trademarks is physical fitness. So this dopeman, you know, was in excellent physical condition at this point. We've been working with him for a few months already. So the guy grabs the pitbull's hind legs, which breaks his pattern, interrupts the fight. We're able to move to the other side of the sidewalk. At the same time, the owner comes out and, um, you know, grabs his pitbull and, and we take off. But I just say that story to illustrate and to punctuate, you know, just how deep this, you know, red zone state is. You know, this is, this is no joke we're talking about, right? So now let's talk about uh, protection dogs for a, for a minute. Um, in my opinion, the ideal protection dog is a dog that is naturally protective. And because the dog is naturally protective, if you have a breed like that that's naturally protective, some Dutch Shepherds, uh, some Malinois is naturally protective, some German Shepherds, um, you know, a bunch of Connie Corsals coming from good bloodlines are naturally protective. You know, I had one, a female, uh, for like 13 years and, yeah, she was naturally protective. Uh, you know, Fila, those type breeds, right? So, it behooves an owner of one of those dogs, if you have a dog that's naturally protective, it behooves the owner to train that dog in protection work so that if there's an incident where the dog bites someone because of, the dog is protective and he's in a situation that you know meets his criteria of a threat, you know he's going to take action and you need to have um, you know control over that situation. And like I'm saying, you you know yelling you know sit stay in here you know is not going to cut it. You know when the dog is you know is that is in that type of mental state. So dog should be naturally protective. <clears throat> the dog should be um, physically fit. And the dog should be uh, social, socialized. Now, there's a difference between a dog being social and a dog being friendly. I was listening to someone earlier today saying, oh, yeah, a, 
a good uh, uh, a police dog or a protection dog, you know, should be friendly. Okay, that's 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 crazy. The guideline that you can look at is what type of temperament constitutes an ideal bodyguard for a human being. You want the person to be physically fit. You want them to have some uh, type of martial background, either martial arts or you know weapons, depending on what the job is, right? And you would expect the person to be social because with a bodyguard, he's going to be able to de-escalate a lot of situations just by talking, just by talking, you know, the nutcase out of it or whatever. But he's definitely not going to be the type to, you know, greet every stranger with a big smile on his face and say, come on up, you know, and meet the celebrity or whoever client is he happens to be guarding, right? He's got to be wary of, of strangers, suspicious of strangers. And, um, you know, it's a healthy, it's a healthy, it's a healthy, it's a healthy suspicion, right? Because that's the job that um, you know he's he, he's paid to perform. So it's the same thing with with dogs. You know they should be um, social. And when we're talking about social, we're talking about uh, a well socialized dog has been exposed to thousands of different situations that don't constitute a threat. So the dog learns that it can relax and can be comfortable in those type of, of situations. Right? It doesn't mean that the dog is friendly. Okay. Zulu is a good example of a social dog, but he's not a friendly dog, okay? When we're out on the street, and he's, he's, he's off leash 96% of the time, and we pass strangers, he just ignores them. You know, he could give two craps about, you know, any, any strangers out there or whatever. Um, you know, inside the house, it's a little bit different. You know, he approaches and, you know, and, and investigates. Now, I remember when he was four months old is when we also started uh, PSA training. Is the first time we went to the, to the PSA club. And when we get there, we get out of the car, the trainer is sitting on the front porch. And so when we approach and Bolo see, um, Zulu sees the guy sitting there, you know, he starts barking. Like, hey, what the hell are you doing sitting out here on the porch for? Like, who does that? <laughs> right? Because to him, that was unusual. To him, it was suspicious. But it was a type of bark where he was really alerting me like, hey, you know, pay attention. There's somebody sitting out here on, on, on the front porch. You know, is this okay? Whatever. So then, you know, as we get up there to the front porch and whatever, you know, Zulu, Zulu is fine with the person, whatever. He's fine with it. He was fine with the trainer after that. But the trainer said, oh, this dog, you know, uh, needs to be socialized. And I told the trainer, this has nothing to do with socialization or lack of socialization because this dog goes everywhere with me. So he's extremely well socialized. And, um, you know, that process is going to continue. I said, this is this this is about um, genetics and bloodline. Okay. That's why, you know, he's responding the way that, the way that, the way that he's responding. All right. So again, that's a social dog, but not a friendly dog. And Feeney, on the other hand, is, um, is, has an aversion to strangers. He's antisocial. She has an aversion to strangers. Uh, very much reminds me of the temperament of the Fila Brasilero. And if you look at the breed description, in the breed description, it says that the dog should have an aversion to strangers an intense dislike for strangers and if it does not have that quality it's you know not considered a, a good fila so if you're not familiar with the history of the fila this is the uh, brazilian mastiff and they were used uh, back in the day to hunt down runaway slaves originally they were using our uh, hound dogs but when the hound dogs bought uh would track down the uh the slave um you know they weren't aggressive so the slave would jump down from the tree and whatever and stab the hound dog kill it and, you know and keep running so then they took the hound dog and they bred it with um, uh, some uh, wild dog that was out there in Brazil and, and, and bred it with another dog also. And that's how they came up uh, with the fila. So now the fila was the type of person, I mean, the type of dog they would hunt down the slave and, um, you know, kill him if the owner, if the slave owner didn't get there, uh, didn't get there in time. Okay, so. So now to the incident. Of, uh, on New Year's Day. So I'm sitting right here, sitting right here at the computer, you know. Feeney was uh, at my feet and my daughter comes into the room and my daughter's 20 years old and she comes to the room and she says, uh, Zulu got out. And I'm like, Zulu got out? Well, how the hell would Zulu get out? Because there's a screen door, a wooden door, then there's a wooden gate and then there's a wrought iron gate that would lead to the street. And that's what I thought she meant when she said got out. I thought she meant like somehow he had gotten out into the street. 
she meant no that he was out in the backyard and she and he wasn't listening to her he wasn't coming inside he wasn't listening to her so so i get up there you know if he's with me we get up and we go back there uh toward the back and um i Zulu was back there with one of my daughter's friends and so i'm about to open the door to tell Zulu to come in and just as i do that this other dog comes down the back staircase which is owned by um my daughter's friend and uh is this dog is a rottweiler mixed with a german shepherd right full grown so i was surprised to startled and see the dog because if we're bringing a, of another dog coming to the house and this dog has been to our house before but you 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 alert me right the proper thing to do is alert me so that i know that this dog is coming in and i can do what i want to do with zulu and uh zulu and afini i mean zulu is um, you know, he's, he's friendly towards other dogs, but you know, he's gotten into this dominance thing lately where he's trying to, you know, hump the dogs and all this stuff. So, you know, I basically, you know, try to keep him separated when, uh, when this dog comes over, his name is Max. So, you know, we keep him separated. So this dog comes down the back steps and surprises the hell out of me and also surprises a Feeney, but when a Feeney sees this dog like she flips immediately goes into the red zone and goes on a full all-out attack and assault right so this dog is much has a size advantage and a strength advantage over a feeny you know he's much bigger you know feeny's probably 63 pounds you know this dog in the high 90s i would estimate climb huh yes Fini, couche. Zulu, lay down. Ready? Go get that. So, speed, the advantage was hers. Agility, physical conditioning. So, even though she was going up against a bigger dog, you know, he was no match for her. Because... She has too many physical advantages. And then play fighting with Zulu all the time. You know, that helps them if they ever get into a dog fight. And then on top of that, you know, she's got the attitude. You know, she's got that fierce attitude. So <clears throat> when I finally, like, get a grip on things, I say, Afini, let go. Which is... A command that she has you know, when we're doing our bite work right so she stops and she hesitates at that second at that second and i say come on let's scoop her up and we start heading toward the uh front of the house where uh where her crate is so as i'm taking her back there i was there taking taking her to the front she's like no kev no kev let, let me down that dog's got no business being here let me go let me go I want to take his eyes out. I'm going to take his eyes out. <laughs> right. So we get to the crate. I put her in the crate. You know, I praise her, though, because, yeah, she's doing the right thing. You know, this dog to her, you know, is a strange dog. And, yeah, what the hell is he doing in the house like that? Just, you know, terrible judgment on the part of my daughter and, uh, you know, th this dog's owner. So then I go to the back of the house again now. Now that Feeney's in the crate, I go to the front of, to the back of the house again because I still have to let Zulu in. And when I get to the back of the house, Max is there frozen like a statue, right? The dog is like scared to death, petrified, right? So his other owner, uh, who was inside the house at that time, um, he has to pick up the dog's two front paws and encourage him to start walking. And then they, you know, they go upstairs to my to my daughter's bedroom. So then I, you know, I bring Zulu inside and whatever. And then I'm saying to my daughter, like, you know, what the hell? Like, why didn't you tell me that? The, the dog that Max was coming to the house today. And so this noise comes out of my daughter's mouth. It sounds like this. Oh, I didn't know they were bringing the dog. I'm like, okay, yeah, great. You didn't know they were bringing the dog until they actually brought the dog. But well, once the dog entered the house, at that point you knew that the dog was with them and you should have, you know, let me know. You know, so that was, you know, bad judgment on their part. And, um... Uh, again, this this illustrates the point that you know if you have a protective dog, um, 
it behooves you to train the dog in uh, protection work and bite work so that when those scenarios arise, you have a vocabulary that the dog is familiar with and you have, you know, control over the, uh, the situation. Well, f three days ago, it was 58 degrees out here. <clears throat> Today we're in the 20s. And look at that. All the dedicated dog owners. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame them because it's not pleasant being out in this weather. But uh, on the other hand, I love having the park all to ourselves. All right, Zulu.